welcome to the art of being human. On the last segment, I started talking about stalking behavior. And the reason I wanted to do that was the fact that the violence in our society has gotten so prevalent, and stalking behavior has increased just as violence has increased, and I consider stalking behavior to be a part of it. So I started talking to you about stalking and about stalkers that I have had. Some of them are dangerous, some of them are not so dangerous. So I want to continue with that today since I've already opened it up. And what I'm going to do is tell you some examples of stalking behavior first that I'm kind of aware of, some of them which I've been involved with. But there was a show on television very recently where a girl and a guy had split up. She was quite young, early 20s. He was fairly young too. And she just didn't think she could live without him, so she started t stalking him. Now for her, it meant that she called him at least a hundred times every day. And she text messaged him at least 200 times every day, sometimes hundreds of times a day. This poor guy couldn't get a break. And she just felt that her life was over with unless he was with her. So he, she kept at him and at him and at him. And of course, this kind of behavior has to stop because it really is abusive to the person who's being stalked. So they talked about that the show and came to a resolution as to how she could get help so she could stop that kind of behavior. In this particular instance, she did not mean any harm to him. But there are times when stalking behavior involves violence and it gets worse and worse. O.J. Simpson, I'd like to remind you, was a stalker. And see what happened. He actually, at least in my opinion, committed murder even though he was released and considered to be innocent. Here's another example. When a person who sits by a window in a building because they can see another building close by and they can see the person that they want to, to watch go out of that other building so they have a chance to see him. So this lady sits by the window in the library. She's at a desk, you know, it's right by a window. The next building over is a counseling center. And uh, when the uh, counselor leaves, he leaves by the same door almost every day, and she has a chance to see him. So she continually stays there so she can see him walk out. She's not making contact with him. Most of the time, he doesn't even know she's there because he's not looking around to see who's sitting at a window at the next building. So that is also stalking behavior. Another example, a man who is sitting in his car and uh, he uh, wants to watch for a person drive by that he knows that he likes very much. And so he watches, and every day she drives by because she leaves work and she uses that road to get home. So he sees her every single day as he's sitting in the parking lot in his car. And sometimes he chooses to follow her home. He doesn't actually get into her house, he just drives behind her, and when she gets to her house, she drives by. Now, how do I know that was going on? She called me, she was terrified, because this person was stalking her. He meant no harm. I've had people in my office said, if only these people I like would pay attention to them. I keep calling them. I want to see them. I'm not going to do them any harm. All I want to do is see them, talk with them, but they don't pay any attention to me. And so she's just very distraught over that. And I had to explain to them, well, they wouldn't want to pay attention to you if you keep bugging them like that, because that is considered to be stalking behavior. None of these people considered what they were doing to be stalking behavior. But stalking behavior can be anything from fairly innocent, although very annoying, to something that's very, very serious in which violence occurs. It has nothing to do with love. So let me go to my chart. Here is a stalking. Stalking, a stalker is totally obsessed by the person that they're stalking. They want to be with them, they want to talk with them, they want to know where they're doing, what they're doing, they want to know where they are, they want to know everything about them, and they're so totally obsessed by the person that they cannot leave them alone. I know when I had a stalker, and I've had some serious stalking incidents in my life that were dangerous, but when I was had a stalker, one of those stalkers, I had a red car, and I, this stalker was in church. 
I had a red car and I would drive to church and I had people actually assigned to be my bodyguards because he was very dangerous and he had a, a dangerous mental illness. And uh, if he saw a red car around the church, even if it wasn't me, even if it wasn't my car, but if it was a red car, he would assume that it was my car. And what he did was he started running around in the backyards of the people who were in, living in that area. So they would look out the window, and there's this guy running around in circles in their backyard. Very bizarre behavior. And they would end up by calling the police and having him hauled off. But what he was trying to do was he was trying to find me because he had to be with me. Another stalker that I had, I would go to lunch in a cafeteria, a, a college cafeteria. It was a faculty dining room, and I was on staff at the college. And so um, I would notice that this guy who was my stalker would stare at me through the windows. There was a set of windows where you could see the cafeteria, and he would stay and just stare and stare and stare. If I was there for a half an hour or three quarters of an hour having lunch with friends, he would stand and at the, immobile right at that window and stare at me. He also used to stare at me and hide behind trees to watch me. So if I were walking by, he'd be behind a tree. And I knew he was there because some of the trees that he hid behind were not as big as he was. So I could see him doing that. He was a very dangerous stalker. So stalking is a total obsession with somebody that a person thinks that they love. And it has nothing to do with love at all. It has to do with power. It has to do with possession. Just like rape. Rape is not an act of passion. It's an act of violence. And it has to do with power and control and obsession. It has nothing to do with love at all. This is what people don't understand. When I talked to a lady about uh, my stalker, she said, I wished I had somebody that loved me as much as he loves you. And I had to correct her and say, this has nothing to do with love. It's power. It's possession. It's ownership. It has nothing to do with love. But the, the obsession is there. And so that's what it is. What's the difference then between love and an obsession? Because sometimes they feel a little bit the same. Well, the difference is this. If two people love each other and they want to be with each other and they join with each other and they get married, they, in a sense, become one flesh. Even the Bible says the two will become one flesh. And yet they remain two individuals. So the two become one yet remain two. I was talking with a friend of mine who's a graduate student, and he had just gotten married. We were both in graduate school, and I was just kidding with him, and I says, well, you've gotten married now, you've lost all your freedom, and I meant it as a joke, but he used it as kind of a teaching moment with me, and he said, you know, Pat, I have never been so free in my life since I got married. The marriage does not cut your freedom, it increases it, because if I want to do something, if I want to take on a project to go somewhere or take an extra class or do something, she is there to support me in it. And if she wants to do something, start a new project, take a class, travel, whatever it is that she wants to do, I am there to support her. So we are together and we are married, but we support each other in what each one of us wants to do. This is where the two become one flesh and yet at the same time remain two, two separate individuals, two separate persons. Personalities. You do not lose your individuality when you get married. You attend to the other person, but the other person also attends to you. You do not have any kind of freedom like that in a stalking situation because there's no freedom allowed. The stalker believes that he or she loves the victim, and the victim loves him or her. Uh, stalking is kind of a, uh, an uh, equal opportunity situation. There are both women and men stalkers, although with the people that I have dealt with and the people that I have counseled, it's usually the men stalking the women, not the other way around. And so I would hazard a guess that more men stalk than women, but I know that women stalk too, so I can't give you stats as to what the percentages are. So getting back to this chart, the stalker believes that he or she loves the victim, but they also believe that the victim loves them, and that's absolutely probably not the case. But what they show, anger, power, 
revenge and abuse, and it can end in violence. This is not something that you want to have. You do not want to have a stalker on your tail. It's just a very bad thing. The stalker wants total access and ownership of the person that they are stalking. In a very bad case, you have no rights. You have to do what the stalker wants, or he will turn violent, or he makes threats on your life. One of the stalkers that I had uh, was constantly threatening my life. He actually told the police and told the university officials where I was teaching that he was going to come and get me with a gun. And if he could get me a, with a gun and take me away for three days, then I could heal him of his mental illness. But what that would have turned out would be a murder-suicide situation in which he would murder me and then kill himself. And I knew that was a possibility in his case because he was so dangerous. So the stalker, you can be stalked and not know it. You can have a stalker and not know you have a stalker. But at some time, the stalker will reveal himself to you. What happened to me, just to give you an example, uh, I got a phone call in my office one day by a man who did not identify himself. And he said, I know you, but you don't know me. I know where you go and what you do, but you don't know me. You've never, you've, you're not aware of me. I am going to be your, um, your favorite person. I'm going to be your unknown admirer. I will admire you, even if it's from a distance, and I will know where you are. Well, this creeped me out. He wouldn't leave his name. He didn't say where he was. He didn't say who he was. And I didn't recognize the voice. But he said he knew where I was. He knew what I did. And he was going to be a secret admirer of me. That was the way that he put it. So I called a friend of mine who I was on staff with. I was on staff with two or three counseling centers at the time. And I called her, and she says, this is our worst nightmare. You have a stalker. At that time, I didn't even connect that he might be a stalker. I just thought it was a weird call. And uh, so it turns out that I found out who the stalker was. I was kind of involved in a, in a falling accident. A friend of mine had taken me to a veterinarian so I could see a kitten that she was going to be adopting. But it was after a snowstorm, and it was icy. And I fell on the steps to the veterinarian's office, and I was so injured that I could barely walk. So I went to church one day, and I'm on crutches. I can barely walk, and I can't get up on the platform. I would normally be in the orchestra, and they would be on the platform, but I couldn't raise my leg to get up on the platform because I was too injured for that, and I had too much pain for that. And this man walked up to me and said, oh, by the way, I'm the one that made you that phone call. I am your admirer. And of course, that was not good because we would be having contact with each other in the church because I was there all the time. And he did some very, very odd and unusual things. And he was a dangerous stalker. There was no question about that. But I'd had worse. So I'm aware of how bad this can get. So eventually they will. Uh, reveal themselves to you, although sometimes you can go for a long time and not even know you have a stalker. I think there was one movie star that found out he had a stalker when he found somebody in his yard, somebody who was trying to get into his house, and then he kind of shooed her away, and then she returned. Over and over and over again, she tried to break into his house. They had her, he had her arrested. She went to court. She went to jail. After she got out of jail, what did she do? She started trying to go back into his house. It's like, I don't know if they can be healed. You know, I'm not sure what it would take to heal a person that's so convicted that they have to have you. I know my stalker, one of them that was really bad, I was sitting in the balcony of the church by myself. I'd gone up there for some reason, and he was down on the lower level. It was quite a large church, and he realized he couldn't see me. He didn't know where I was. 
And he just was so frantic, he started running around in circles in the lower part of the church, just like he did in people's backyards. And so I just got out of there as quick as I could. He was like that. Then we put him to the test one day. I was sitting in, it was like a foyer, like a reception area. There were people around me, and they, we were doing it kind of as a test. We had two or three guys and two or three ladies, and we were sitting and talking, and we were almost like in a circle, but we were kind of spread out, so there was plenty of room for me to move across the room or somebody to move to me. And uh, he stood like on the outside of that circle, and he stared and stared and stared at me, and he paced back and forth. It was almost like he was a caged animal. He was just pacing back and forth and staring at me, so you knew he was dangerous and you knew he wasn't normal. I hesitate to give you his diagnosis because of the two very serious stalkers I've had, both of them had about the same diagnosis, and they both had hallucinations, and they both had delusions. And yet I want to reiterate the fact that, for the most part, mentally ill people or people with emotional problems are not violent. There's only about 4% violence among the people who are being treated by psychiatrists. And there are a lot of people who just have problems they need to have help with in counseling because the problems are too much for them, but they're not violent at all. So you can't go into the field thinking that you're going to be raped or tortured or killed, but it does sometimes happen. But it doesn't happen frequently. I happen to have two very serious stalkers, and there was a possibility of a third stalker that I was never really quite sure about. And I had the worst ones, too, wouldn't you know? So, stalkers will follow you, stare at you, hide to observe you, hunt for you, try to be on your property or even in your house. I woke up one day and went downstairs and found a woman in my kitchen. How did she get there? I hadn't even opened the office yet. And there she was, standing in my kitchen. I wasn't even fully dressed. I had a nightgown on. So I ushered her out in the office, and I closed the door and told her I'd be with her as soon as I could. But she was way too early. I don't even know how she got into this day, but she did. They misperceive what you say and uh, to mean that you want a relationship with them. And this is what you have to be careful of. Most police will tell you, and I'll be giving you a list a little later if we get to it on this segment, of what to do and what not to do if you have a stalker to keep yourself safe. And the police always told me, and I caution you here, this was several years ago, and what the police might tell you today might be a little different than what I was told at the time. But I'm going to tell you what the police told me because it still may apply. But you should never make contact with a stalker. You should never have anything to do with them. You should never respond to them in any way. If they speak to you, you should stare right in front of you like you didn't even hear them. If they send gifts to you, you should return them. You cannot let them think that you are interested in responding to them in any way because they misperceive so much that even if you say something to them that's very, very negative, like, get out of my space, I don't want to see you anymore, just buzz off, that would not be a positive comment. Most people would get the idea that you didn't want to see them. But they, because you responded at all, would assume that you want to have a relationship with them. Why? Not on the basis of what you said, because what you told them was, get away from here, but on the basis of the fact that you responded to them at all. So that's what you have to consider. They, mis they misrepresent and misperceive what you say to mean that you want a relationship with them, even if you're telling them basically that you don't. It's better not to speak to them at all. Now, the stalker that I had in church was told that if I complained, if, even if he looked at me, and I complained because he looked at me, he would be arrested. So if I was ever in the foyer or around in the area where he was, he used to shift his eyes and look up at the ceiling. It was really quite an odd sight. I'd be around and suddenly he's looking at the ceiling because he thinks he's going to be arrested because I would complain about him looking at me. 
Now, it, it got to be dangerous. It really got to be dangerous, and the police were involved. Two police departments were involved. I had bodyguards to keep me safe. Can you imagine why movie stars have bodyguards? It's the same kind of thing. If people who are following them, like the paparazzi, or people who are just really obsessed by them, they're the greatest star, they're the greatest movie star, the greatest singer, or whatever, a certain percentage of those people may well become stalkers. And stalking can be very, very dangerous. So they also get angry at you. If you don't cooperate with what they want, they get very angry with you. My stalker wanted my, my address. He wanted my phone number and my home phone number. He already had my office number because he called to let me know that he was my secret admirer. And uh, I wouldn't give it. It would be very dangerous to give it. And he would yell and scream, I've got to have it. You've got to give it to me. In other words, you have got to do what I want you to do, or I will be very angry with you. That is not love. That is possession. That's why it's not love. There is no freedom in this at all, and you can really get hurt. They will force themselves on you, and they will wait. And this is one thing I want to caution you about, and I, I will close with this. A stalker who intends to do harm to you is very patient. They will wait for months or years for you to be in just the right position for them to do the violence. Supposing that you have a stalker and you know it, and they're waiting to shoot you, and that does happen, by the way. So you don't drive home on a certain road that you know where he may be. You take another route home, and you keep doing it continually for weeks and months. Then you say, nothing's happened, it must be safe now. And this is an actual case. The person thought she was safe because it had been months before she'd gone on that old road, and so she decided to try it. And wouldn't you know he was there and he shot her. Because they're patient, they'll wait until they can get to you, and then they'll do what they want to do. So I want to continue with this next time. We're about out of time now. So I want to continue with this uh, next time and focus more in terms of what can you do to protect yourself against a stalker if you have one. And you may not know that you have one, but if you do know, what do you do? And I've mentioned a couple of things already, but I would like to continue with this next time. So please join me then.